Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Ultra Fuel. Today with me, AJ and Jonas. You join us here in the beautiful Pyrenees Mountains and this weekend we have with us the all new Audi SQ8. Well, it weighs 2.2 tons, but it also has 900 Newton meters of torque and 435 horsepower. So is that enough to make this sporty? Well, we have beautiful roads, beautiful locations and beautiful weather. So Jonas, do your magic. Play that B-roll. This SUV comes packed with technology. It has over 39 assistance systems and 23 scanners, including five cameras, five radar scanners, one laser scanner, and even 12 ultrasound sensors. Up front, this is not so different than the S-Line in the standard Q8, but there are some special touches to make the SQ8 stand out. First of all, the LED lights are standard, but you can upgrade them to the matrix LED lights, which do things like automatic uh, high beam adjustment and casting the light across uh, into the corner and uh, ensuring that the car coming in front of you isn't being dazzled. So they're very intelligent systems. And that also gives you the cascading daytime running light uh, come indicator LED strip. Interestingly as well, the, head, uh, the high beam for the headlamp is lowered down and it's a little bit blacked out. So initially the impression is that this is the main headlight and it's very slim and this just seems like a darker element, but I like that they've made this a little bit more subtle to make the front look very sleek, but in reality this entire section is the headlamp. Going further up, I also like how the hood of the of the engine uh, cover the comes a little bit further down over the top of the mass, this large uh, uh, the mask around the front grille, so it gives a very nice three-dimensional look as well. As we go further down, we have a lot of intakes. This car comes with, and we'll take a look in more detail later on, with the large turbocharged uh, diesel engine, and it has two intercoolers, and for those two intercoolers, we have large radiators and vents on either side of the grille. Here is, for example, one of the scanners. There's also a pressure-induced um, clean, uh, cleaner that will come out and spray water to clean these sensors as well. That means that the actual logo is very three-dimensional now. It's not like how we see in a lot of uh, VW cars, for example, where it houses the radar scanner and hence it's, it's two-dimensional. So now, because the scanners are on either side, the cameras around the, uh, in the front as well, um, there is a three-dimensional logo. Further down, there is one strip of black plastic that separates the mask from the lower part of the bumper. I think it does a really nice job of breaking up the visual mass of the front, but still retaining that aggression, and a very cool chin spoiler diffuser in the front. Also unique to the SQ8 are the design of the grille itself, so we have vertical slats with chrome strips, and again, just makes it look more menacing and more athletic. The SQ8 is five meters long and two meters wide, which means that it's a little bit shorter than the Q7, of course, but it's actually a bit wider than the Q7 as well. It weighs around 2,200 kilograms, which is a hefty amount. As standard, you get 21 inch rims for the wheels, uh, but you can optionally get them with 22 inches, like the ones we have here. I also like this dusted bronze gold finish. Very cool, very rally-like. If we peer inside that, you will also see that this car comes with the optional carbon ceramic disc brakes, huge discs. I mean, I think these discs are bigger than the rims on my car. And to stop those big discs, we have six piston calipers up front. You can also get them optionally painted in red if that, that tickles your fancy. And peering behind the whole wheel, we can also see that this has the air suspension. So the SQ8, uh, SQ8 comes as standard with the air suspension and the anti-tilt 
active uh, split roll bars. You know what the split roll bar means that, uh, well, for example, let's say we're driving down the road and we're taking a, we're making a left turn. There's a sharp left hand bend. What happens because it's a tall SUV is that the, the SUV will start leaning on the outside wheels on the outside, so that would be the right side. But with the anti-tilt function and the air suspension, first of all, this air suspension becomes really stiff on all the or on all the four wheels, so that that itself prevents the body roll a little bit. And then the anti-roll bar will push down on the outside wheel and give a little bit of slack on the inside wheel. That way you're kind of pushing out on the outside and giving a little bit of slack on the inside. And this way it remains very flat around corners and we can test this out once we're out on the road. But some other functions with the air suspension, of course, is that because it's easy to modulate, um, you can have different modes in terms of how comfortable it is and things like that. Plus you can raise the suspension by up to six millimeters, like, like you see right now, to achieve 25 centimeters of uh, ground clearance. So, sorry, six centimeters. It can be raised and it can also be lowered by three centimeters. So at high speed, the center of gravity will drop. So pretty useful system that way. It's also uh, important to note that you can also get the SQ8 with the rear axle steering, which we also have equipped. And I really think it's a great feature to have for an SUV of this size. So at slow speeds, um, the rear axle turns in the opposite direction as the front axle by up to five degrees. This effectively makes the car kind of spin around its axis and then that way reduces the turning circle. But at high speeds, the rear axle also steers in the same direction as the front axle by again up to five uh, degrees. And in this way, the car kind of strafes a little bit back and forth, left and right. And at high speeds, this remains, uh, this helps uh, retain a lot of stability. The side profile as well, the SQ8 or the regular Q8 is trying to hark back to a lot of the elements that made the original Quattro and the original Quattro philosophy really great. So we see some nice haunches around the wheel arches. Of course, we saw the large uh, mask in the front. You also have the contrasting color casing for the rear view mirror. Another dash of contrasting color along the bottom. You'll also notice that the wheel arches are also in the body color. So you don't have them in the black cladding. So this way it kind of visually lowers the car and again makes it a little bit more sporty. And of course, the core of the Q8 is this roof line. And while some of the other coupe SUVs like the BMWs and the Mercedes have a very rounded coupe roof in the back, this is more of a fastback. And I think it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like a it, coupe at, at, at first, you know, from certain angles. Of course, when you're up close and you're looking at it like this, you're like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> this is a very interesting design, but I like it. I think this is a very tasteful coupe roof line. The SQ8 and also the Q8, first of all, have frameless doors. So that means that the window does not have a frame. They're also dual pane. And you also get a soft close function optional. So the door will automatically shut itself and the window will go back up in place, as you can see. So watch the door and then watch the window. At the back as well, you don't have a frame for the window and you can automatically retract the sun shade and likewise you have a soft close and the window will also retract. So that means that it's really nice to see that over here this B pillar is very unique in the way that it's it's not a part of either of the doors and I think overall that also adds to the appeal of the design of the side profile. Here at the back of the SQ8 that sloping roofline is all the more evident. In fact, you can already see by just taking a look inside that you've lost out, you've lost out on a lot of space in the interior for the cargo area. And we'll take a closer look inside the trunk later on. At the top of the, uh, the windshield in the rear window is the spoiler, body colored, but it is flanked by these glossy black inlays around the sides, rear windshield wiper, the Audi logo over here. This section is again, very classic quattro. You can also see the lights um, going all the way across the middle of the hatch. Again, emphasizing the width. And because of that sloping roof line, it does seem very squat, very wide, very sporty. So I think it, it achieves a very nice design overall that way. Three-dimensional lights as well. Parking camera. And as we go further down, the bottom part of the bumper with the diffuser is in a contrasting color. Now let's talk a little bit about the exhaust pipes. So 
as you can see, there seems to be apparently quad pipes, two on each side. Now this SQ8 comes with a four liter V8 diesel engine, and we'll look at that in a minute. But there, even though there are two tips on each side, this one is just cosmetic. It's just blocked off in the back. And this one, the, the front is just a cosmetic casing and the actual exhaust tip is just nestled inside. And the same for this. So the outside is just cosmetic and the inside actually houses the actual exhaust pipe. So you do have two exhaust tips. You don't have four. What do you think about it? In fact, this also has a sound actuator. So even though it's a diesel V8, they try to make it sound a lot nicer and we'll take a closer look at that as well. The SQ8 can do zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.8 seconds. That's pretty impressive for a 2.2 ton SUV. So what makes it possible? Well, here it is, the heart of the beast. The SQ8 comes with the four liter V8 TDI turbo diesel engine. We've seen this before in the SQ7 as well. Pretty interesting engine. For example, this has a sequential turbo, a pair of turbos. One turbo which is running at lower RPMs and a second turbo which then activates at higher RPMs. But there is also an elect electric uh, compressor. So the compressor works to fill the gaps where the turbochargers don't have enough boost, therefore eliminating turbo lag. So at idle, the first turbo is just spooling a little bit, providing enough boost. And then once you hit the throttle pedal, the compressor will send a charge of high pressure air to spool the turbo and then provide more boost. This also has a, um, each, each cylinder has two exhaust valves actually. And one, pair, one, set, one of the valves are always closed. So when the first turbo is running, only one exhaust valve is used. And then at higher RPMs, the second valve is also opened using the cam, uh, special cam uh, uh, activation system that the Audi has. And then the second exhaust valve is also opened in each cylinder and that feeds the exhaust gases to spool the second turbo, the second sequential turbo. So in reality, you have three um, chargers. You have the electric compressor, you have the first turbo, and then you have the second stage turbo. But apart from this, this also has a mild hybrid system. So that means there is a mild hybrid um, electric uh, motor, which doesn't directly run the wheel. So that's not a real hybrid, it's a mild hybrid. So it runs the ancillary systems. So for example, when you have this engine in the uh, efficiency or economy driving mode, then for example, on the highway, if you're cruising at hundred kilometers per hour and you're just coasting, the engine can shut off completely. But to run all the other systems for your technology, for the power steering, um, for the air conditioning and so on, that's when this electric mild hybrid motor will take over and then power these systems. And it recuperates the energy that is lost um, due to braking and things like that and uses that to charge itself. So pretty interesting system. Overall, this combination is able to produce 435 horsepower and 900 Newton meters of torque, 900, wow. That is a very large number, enough to stop the earth from rotating and start it back up again in the other direction, if you ask me. And coupled with that is an eight speed or a uh, torque converter Tiptronic automatic transmission, which drives the Audi Quattro all-wheel drive system. It's a rear wheel drive biased um, all-wheel drive system. The rear axle also has a limited slip differential, so provides good traction um, when you're putting power down coming out of a corner. And as we spoke about earlier, it also has some pretty cool technology in the chassis as well. The air suspension, which is also tuned for sports um, handling in the specific driving mode where it'll be a little bit more stiffer and can lower the car itself, plus the active anti-tilt, uh, anti-roll bars, which will ensure that the car isn't tilting as much when you're going at high speed around corners. Make sure you follow us on Instagram. We post a lot of pictures from behind the scenes when we're filming our episodes. We put a lot of polls and questions so you can tell us what you want to see, what are your questions that you should have answered in the episode, and we will cater to those needs.
Here we have the key for the SQ8. In comparison to the size of the car, this key is very slim and very sleek. So it's a bit interesting that it's contrasting. Of course, you have keyless entry, so now it's locked. You just come up close and touch the door handle and the door will unlock automatically. Again, I really like you know, how the B-pillar is static because there is no frame for the window. And as you can see over here, you know, you have, um, it's a double glazing and this way it ensures more acoustic damping. The door feels heavy. There's a nice heft to it. It also has a nice sound as you close the door. But even if you don't, you know, the soft close will always ensure that the door is closed properly. It is a bit heavy and it opens fairly wide so you have very easy access. The materials are really top-notch. Plush material, soft touch on the top, this nice Alcantara material along the side. You can also get carbon fiber which is a unique option here in the SQ8. Again emphasizing the sporty character of the SUV. Aluminium inserts, the door handles are also metal and have a nice heft to it. So all these control interfaces are really chunky and I like that. Also soft materials down here, but this is hard. This also comes with the Bang & Olufsen sound system and trust me, it sounds phenomenal. I really enjoy good music and this sound system is one of my favorites this year that I've um, experienced so far. Large door pockets as well where you can fit your water bottles and some extra items. You also have controls for all the four windows, child lock and uh, the mirror control. So if we take a look at the interior, so you have several different options, but unfortunately you'd only get full leather interiors and we would have liked if there was an option for synthetic leather um, as well. But this is the sport seats and these seats have a large number of features as well. Down here you can see the controls for you know, reclining the base and adjusting the, uh, the, the backrest and also the lumbar support positioning. But this car, uh, this seat also has so many functions. If you push this button, and I'll show you in a minute later on once we're inside, you can control things like the amount of bolstering here on the base, the side bolstering on the backrest. You can also control the extension of the base as well. And it has massaging, ventilation, and heating. So <laughs> plenty of controls. Um, likewise for the steering wheel, you can also adjust it uh, electronically with this knob to find a very suitable seating position. The interior of this SQ8 is predominantly black, including the headliner. And since you have that sloping roof line, the windshield is not that big. So it does feel a bit dark in here. Although I can tell you the space in terms of width is fantastic. I have plenty of headroom. I can, I can really put my seat a lot higher if I wanted to anyway. So there is space, but just because of this dark color, it does feel a little bit, a little bit more hemmed in. The dashboard just really hugs itself around you. From the door through the front, it kind of has this one cohesive design line that curves around you. And everything is also kind of pointed towards the driver ever so slightly. So it looks really, it looks really futuristic. I also really like how the air conditioning vents there's this one large uh, strip at the top. So I think the design is really nice. It, it kind of comes together. The carbon fiber that we saw on the doors can also be had here across the front of the dashboard. Glossy black area right across here. And when the car is off, when, the, um, when all the screens are off, actually, because it's all the same shade, you will see in a minute, it looks like one large dark black surface. So that's pretty cool. But of course, when you do have the systems on, you know, it still has a very dark contrast. And we'll look more into detail later on. The steering wheel also, I think is really sporty and has a really nice uh, size and shape. It's very large, but it kind of, uh, you know, because it's a large car, it suits the personality. The contour of the steering wheel is also really nice for you to fit your, uh, your hand and your thumb and your fingers and grip the wheel really nicely with this perforated material. So really nice. Although the thing I don't like about the steering wheel is the paddle shifters. I think for the size of the wheel to kind of uh, emphasize how interesting or how uh, sporty this uh, SUV is, these don't really match. They're, they're too small. They're a bit 
flimsy feeling and they don't have a very satisfying click or feel. I would have liked a cold metal touch, you know, maybe aluminium, a little bit longer so it, and, and, and with a nice, you know, resounding click sound, you know, that it was very satisfying to use. And I don't get that from this and we'll take a look into that in more detail as we're driving. Your usual windshield washing, uh, sorry, windshield uh, wiper stock, your light stock, and the automatic cruise control that we look into more detail, the stock is over here. Even the buttons on the left-hand side for the uh, lights are also, you know, touch sensitive and provide haptic feedback. So even if you just put your finger over them, they will light up and give you some options. So I, overall, I really like the system. As you can see, the minute I touch my finger on that, it shows the different options and then I can press on it and then I can toggle between the different options. This also comes as standard with the virtual cockpit and we're quite familiar with this across other models in the VW group, but here as well, it's just taken up to 11. You have many different views that you can toggle between to have the map, for example, across the entire screen, or to have this combination with the map, the uh, this tachometer, digital readout, speed, and also your exit instructions. You can also just go through different menus. For example, you can see your driving data you can see right now. We've not been driving too long on this stretch and we've been averaging about 15 liters for 100 kilometers. But if you're on the highway and you're using a light throttle, you're letting the car do all the work uh, and maintain an efficient uh, drive, then you can see numbers around 10.3, uh, 10.4. We were easily able to see numbers like that. But I also like, for example, you know, as I scroll down, if I hit the bottom, it just kind of shuffles a little bit to let me know I'm at the bottom. And they have a very nice user interface, the way they fit in the animation. So I really like this infotainment system in general. I think it's one of the, the best in the market at the moment. All right, now let's talk about the infotainment system. So apart from the heads up display, the virtual cockpit, we also have two screens right here and you can control the entire car with these two screens. And I really like this layout. The only thing that I don't like, and I'll, let me start off with that, is that it does leave quite a bit of fingerprints as you start using them, as you can see. But, you know, you can't have everything. So this system is, I think, very intuitive. It gives you a haptic feedback. So when you press, you can feel a little vibration and a click. It's very smooth to respond. Everything has a little bit of an animation. As you can see, if you just tap on it, it gives you a little bit of an animation. There's a lot of different features that you can select for the car and we can go into more details. Even things like having interior lighting is really nice. You can see that it, there's many different hues. There's 30 different colors you can choose from and it kind of lights up the entire cabin on the door and the dashboard and the foot wells with different colors and you, know, you can select which contours you want to have it and you can also select which color and there's Oh, there's 30 different colors you can choose. So it's, in the night, trust me, it gives such a nice aura uh, within the cabin. But of course, there's many different options um, for the Audi Drive Select. The seats are as well really configurable. There's a shortcut button right on the seat itself, but you can control things like, for example, extending the, the base, and you can also extend and um, retract the bolstering on the base for the sides and the, the side bolstering on the back. You also have different um, massages that you can set with different intensities. There's a whole bunch of different options. You can also decide the temperature. So if it's right now, it's really hot outside. So we can decide, do we want it to be cooling more on the top or on the base? And same for the heating. And it's just, of course, you can have the easy entry for passenger and driver seat, and you can store the memory. You have two presets as well. A lot of other assistance systems, like for example, parking aid, uh, which gives you a lot of um, uh, sensors and also a 3D top-down view. So if you press this toggle button uh, down here, you can see here that we can actually render the car in this 3D space. So there's cameras, there's five different cameras um, all around the car and they're capturing a live feed of the surroundings and then augmenting that and then placing this 3D model of our car within that space. And you can see exactly where you're sitting in case you're trying to navigate in a tight area with curbs on either side, you can make sure that you don't hit the, um, 
the, the rims. And the, the cool thing is, if I turn on the hazard lights, for example, even the car in the animation turns its lights on. So I like this detail. It's also a very intuitive, smart system where I can just, um, you know, easily find my way around. And I've been using this quite a lot, so that's pretty cool. There's a lot of other assistance systems, like um, the, you have the pedestrian emergency braking, you have lane departure warning, you have lane keeping assist with steering intervention, smart cruise control, blind spot monitoring, cross traffic alert. Um, there's a whole host of different assistant systems which we can spend hours talking about. There's night vision, <laughs> there's Audi presense, distance warning, and intersection assist, so many different things. But on the whole, like I said, the this is one of my uh, favorite systems so far. Because it's a connected car, you have live updates for weather and news, points of interest, and because all of these cars are talking to each other, um, you can get updates regarding you know, traffic conditions, parking spaces, road conditions, and so on and so forth. As always, you also have Apple CarPlay, and you can also use your iPhone to connect to your uh, car, and you can also have uh, Android Auto. So pretty much everything you could think of is covered. There's also a really nice navigation system. So you have Google Maps with the satellite view, so you can easily um, you know, zoom in, change the orientation, and you have a really nice 3D satellite view of the terrain and the, the landscape. And we've been using this to find some beautiful locations to shoot our introduction B-roll and just to go driving. So this navigation is also very intuitive because you have it, you have commands on so many different areas here, of course, but on your virtual cockpit. And Jonas, if you look at the heads up display as well, you can see uh, a lot of uh, information with that. Anyway, so a lot about this, but there's a lot more to talk about here as well. Let's quickly touch base on this as well. This generally serves as a supplementary um, control system. Right now it is purely for the climate control, but for example, if I were to say, enter a new address for the navigation, this becomes a keyboard, so I can see what I'm typing here. So that way, you know, this, the combination of these two systems works out really well and is very intuitive. But like I mentioned, generally this will be, uh, this will be your climate control. And right now, you know, it's so intuitive that it's so hot outside today that, you know, we were starting off at like 22 degrees or something. Uh, we had the uh, with the um, with the climate control and I wanted to make it low instead of clicking all the time I just slid my finger down and then it was so intuitive that it already went to the low position so that way there's different ways you can uh, interact with this uh, interface and again you get that haptic feedback with that clicking sound um, so it's pretty cool that way down here you have some hot key uh, some shortcuts for traction control hazard lights and uh, defoggers but you also have the drive select. And this is probably the thing I'm not so happy about. I would have preferred a rocker switch instead of this because I found this a little bit fiddly to use when I quickly wanted to change from economy mode to normal mode or dynamic mode and things like that. Because you have to click once to activate the menu and then click again to change between the different options. So you can see here in the auto mode, it kind of analyzes how you're driving and picks the, the right profile for the suspension height, the, the damping, the steering weight, the transmission, the engine throttle response, all of that will be controlled, but you can make it dynamic. And you can see here now that the air suspension is lowering the car to the bottom most, um, uh, the, the bottom most setting. So the car has a lower center of gravity, becomes more hunkered down. You have comfort, efficiency, all road and off road. So in all road mode, the, um, the suspension, air suspension raises itself completely to the highest position. You get 25 centimeters of ground clearance. And you can also set these things up individually. You can see the drive system, the suspension, the steering, the engine sound. So this also has the uh, sound actuator so you can make it pronounced or subdued like you can see up here. So, a lot of different driving modes that you can see over here. Start stop button with the red light around the ring. This is to activate your parking sensors and your camera that we showed you a little bit earlier. And like similar to the BMW system as well, you have a one touch, one key button to turn all your assistant systems on or keep it basic or then have an individual setting. So in this way you can quickly 
For example, you don't want steering intervention when you're driving on twisty mountain roads in sport mode because you want to have full complete control and feedback of the steering wheel so you can quickly jump to an individual mode there. Of course, you also have the volume knob and you can turn off and on the sound altogether. And we really like this. Jonas made a really great observation. So he said, you know, when I'm driving and we're always talking to each other, I have the control for the volume on the steering wheel so I can turn it down whenever I want to right here very easily. But Jonas, when he wants to reach out and, you know, to talk to me, if the steering, if the volume control was somewhere on the top, it's a bit of a stretch. Instead, this is right in his, uh, you know, right next to him and he can quickly turn the volume down tell me something and then turn the volume back up. So in fact, the, you know, the fact that this is kind of you know, oriented towards the passenger is actually very useful and having a physical knob for the volume control is always much more preferred than having a touchscreen. This is the shifter for the 8-speed Tiptronic automatic torque converter gearbox. It's of course just a digital controller, so you can leave your arm on that and it's kind of has a very nice surface area for you to keep your palm um, if you want to. You have the buttons to uh, to enable your to change between the different modes and gear selectors parking uh, brake which is just a button here and then if you're in drive you can also flick the gear lever to the right and if you want to use that to uh, move it up and down to shift but of course there's the paddle shifters on the steering wheel itself electronic parking brake and auto hold beverage holders which also have a 12 volt power socket, another little tray here to keep some items, a very plush and wide armrest which you can extend and also position vertically. Let's give it the shake test. It doesn't want to budge at all, so pretty solid. Inductive phone charger, you have your SIM card slot, your SD card, a couple USB ports, but this area is very shallow. There's not a very deep um, a cubby hole at all. It's just barely enough to keep maybe a phone and a small and your sunglasses and that's about it really. All right, let's take a look in the back seat. The door opens really wide and it's also um, fairly tall so easy access to the back seat. Materials are also very nice, top-notch, soft touch here, Alcantara, carbon fiber, nice plush materials here on the door, an ashtray, if that tickles your fancy. So also very nice and damped, just this little flap. So I like the amount of detail that they've spent on all of this. Large door pocket with a bottle holder as well. Getting inside is also fairly easy. Thanks to this SUV ground clearance that it, you know, the extra ground clearance that it has, you don't have to stoop down to climb inside. There's a lot of uh, gap here since the wheelbase is fairly long so you don't have to kind of navigate and squeeze between a wheel arch there's nothing uh, impeding into the interior space this seat is set to my driving position I'm five foot eight or 1.7 meters and yeah I have plenty of knee room I can slide my feet under the front seat because the uh, this the front seat is on kind of like this uh, this this platform um, right here you can see this extra height even if the front seat is completely in the bottommost position, there is still enough space for me to slide my feet under. A net down here, integrated head restraints for the front seat, so you kind of have to appear from either side. We don't have the panoramic sunroof, and I would definitely recommend you should get it. There's a lot of black inside the cabin. Even though the materials are nice, this color just makes it feel a little bit tighter than it really is. The rear seat is also fairly adjustable. You can slide it forward all the way up to liberate more space in the trunk. You can also recline and change the angle of the backrest to make it more comfortable for you. There are also vents here in the B pillar, along with a third and fourth climate zone for the individual left and right passengers here in the back. Of course, with the vents, but you can also have uh, two different climate zones here as you can see and you can set your own temperature you also have seat heaters I also really like how Jonas if you look over there I really like how the uh, the sunshade goes down and this flap closes itself and it's also interesting to note that both the passengers have controls for both the rear windows so if it's just one passenger sitting here in the back, I have control over both the windows and if I want to open and close them or open and close this 
um, shade. There's also isofix points. And interestingly, you know, they've, <laughs> the detail they've spent throughout this car in engineering, all these little things like, you know, this, uh, this sunshade is so great, but they still have these pop-out isofix point covers. And trust me, you're gonna lose them the minute you take them out. I always like um, the system where these just are like a flap, they're spring-loaded and they just go inside, but well, you win some and you lose some. But at least they're really easy to identify, so it's not gonna be a hassle mounting those seats in. Let's check the middle seat. There is a fairly wide transmission tunnel in the middle, but it's not that tall. And the bench itself is not that uncomfortable. The backrest is a little bit firm, but on the whole, it's not too uncomfortable. I still have just enough headroom sitting here in the middle, and there is enough space to share uh, in the footwells with my co-passengers. Of course, central armrest with two cup holders, which would look really nice. And you can also flip the seat down in the middle so that you can keep your skis. Let's take a look inside the trunk. Of course, because of this roof line, we have lost quite a bit of trunk space. An automatic tailgate. The portal shelf also retracts automatically, which is a nice touch. Well, in reality, you do lose out a little bit in the height because of this sloping roof line, but you still get 605 liters of boot space in this uh, current configuration. But you can, as we saw, slide the back bench forward. Then you can also topple the seats, and then you can even get up to 1755 liters of boot space, which I think is pretty good and pretty decent. Because of the air suspension, it's also possible with the switches over here to raise and lower the entire car. As you can see, it's dropping down, so it's easier for me now to load heavy suitcases inside. There's also a very shiny metal plate here to ensure that I don't scuff the bumper or damage my suitcase. And you can see now it's actually come all the way down. It's really fantastic. It's so low. Before as I was this high, it's come down significantly. You have railings on the side with these separators so you can perhaps put something away back here. You can also put these on either side to make a divide, division between the the front and the back section of the trunk. Similarly, you have this, and we can move this around as well to accomplish the same thing if you wanted to have it here or across as well. Below this, you can see there's an emergency tire repair kit. There's also the battery for the mild hybrid system down there. Some first aid kit and reflective vests, a 12 volt power socket in there some nice lights to illuminate the inside of the trunk. But one omission that I find quite surprising are there's no switches for me to be able to tumble the back bench. So, which means I have to go all the way around. So, and in this way, you do get a very flat loading area so you can carry long items like maybe your cupboard from Ikea. All right, let's start off by driving up here in the mountains in the Pyrenees because this is where the SQ8 is trying to show off and prove itself that it is a worthy sports SUV. So in order for me to allow the SUV to set itself up to achieve this, I'm going to go into the drive select mode and go into dynamic. Now many things have changed. The air suspension is much more stiffer. The throttle response is really sharp. The 8-speed Tiptronic torque converter auto box shifts up much later so that it gives me all that torque. That electric compressor is always charging so that it can punch and provide extra boost to the uh, and spool up the first turbocharger. And then the steering is also significantly heavier. So all of these things try to help out with the driving performance. So let's put it to the test. I can also take control with these paddle shifters. Although I must say these paddle shifters seem a bit small and um, they're, not that, they're not that nice to touch. For the steering wheel, which I think is really beautiful and has such a great grip, the paddle shifters somehow let it down just a little bit. This is a very popular stretch for the world famous 
uh, um, Tour de France. So we see a lot of cyclists here, so we have to be very careful on this road. It's very narrow, but very beautiful. The sound actuator also helps amplify that sound, make it more sonorous. Even though it's a diesel, you still get that nice V8 rumble inside the cabin. It does sound a little bit artificial. Nothing can ever replace this real thing, but it's better than not having it at all. And you have the option to turn it off when you don't want to. I'll be honest, even though this has that sequential turbo, the two intercoolers on either side, that uh, mild hybrid system and the electric compressor, sometimes it just seems that there isn't enough punch in this engine. 435 horsepower is a healthy amount, no doubt. At 900 Newton meters is a lot, it's ample. But at the end of the day, this is not pinning me back in my seat. Like I expect, you know, I have my foot flat down and it's, it's adequate performance. It's not ample and it's not, I would, I would even go as to say that it's not very exciting. It's good enough for most people, but if you really want an out and out sporty SUV, this doesn't seem to have what it takes at the moment at least. We'll have to see when they bring out the petrol version of this and maybe then it'll be a little bit different. The 8-speed Tiptronic as well, you know, it doesn't react as sharply as you want to. You know, for example, if I shift down right now, I hit the pedal, it takes, it takes half a second for it to react to my input and actually go ahead and shift down. The brake pedal, on the other hand, is really progressive. So you have a very gradual bite, which gives you a lot of confidence and feedback, and you can really dial in how much brake pressure you're applying, um, and very, with a lot of precision. The steering, on the other hand, as well, it just doesn't f give me enough feedback to be able to tackle high speeds on these narrow corners. It doesn't give me the confidence. Yes, in the sport dynamic mode, it does become significantly heavier, but it's just, it just feels a little bit artificial to me. And I said the same thing when I drove the standard Q8 uh, back in, I think, summer of last year, around the same time last year in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. So perhaps not the apt place to test um, a, 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 a stylish SUV, but even there I was quickly able to say that the steering, while it's got a nice, pretty decent rack, it's not quick, but it's, for this size of an SUV, it's fairly sharp and responsive, that rear axle steering really helps out. I would recommend you need to get the rear axle steering. Trust me, in the city it really helps out, and out on these kind of twisty roads, you need that to make the car feel much more nimble. When I try to push it around these corners, that anti-roll or anti-tilt stabilization system and that um, air suspension really work. This is something that I've seen before in the Touareg as well. This anti-tilt function works really well. So that uh, split anti-roll bar, when you're going around a corner, will push the outside wheels down a little bit and then stiffen up the entire setup. Therefore, tries to maintain a very flat composure as you go around corners. And it does that pretty well. So overall, unfortunately, I am a little bit disappointed. You know, I, th I was expecting we thought with this very complex engine with 435 horsepower and all that torque, the torque, you know, I was expecting it to really shove me back into the seat, but it doesn't. And that Tiptronic gearbox doesn't respond as sharply as a, as a true sporty SUV, uh, as a true S Audi S would do. The Quattro is still rear wheel biased. The locking the rear differential, the uh, limited slip, means that when you put your foot down around a corner, it will rotate very nicely around you. The four wheel steering and the Quattro and the locking differential in conjunction with that anti-tilt function. The chassis in overall is actually really good. I think it's just the drivetrain, the engine and the gearbox combination would somehow let it down a bit. So I'm gonna quickly turn around and we can go downhill and see how the car behaves uh, when you're just trying to maintain momentum and riding on the brake. Visibility also is pretty good. The A-pillar is fairly sharp in its rake, so, and the rear window on the side, the outside rear view mirror, 
um, rather is right in this you know uh, in my vision over here so while it's great to have a view out back when I'm trying to look through a corner like right now I want to make this left hand corner it kind of is obstructive and I have to lean out to the side a bit so it just seemed to me that the SQ8 isn't really egging you to really go fast or isn't trying to say I can keep up with supercars or sports cars on the racetrack it's trying to say hey you want a big luxurious technologically advanced SUV but you want to have the ability to go fast in a straight line well this is the SUV for you and because it's a diesel we you do still get pretty you know respectable mileage before we got up into the mountains we were driving around in the countryside I had it in the um, efficiency mode and the adaptive cruise control which is really smart and I'll get into this later on once we're out of the out of the mountains I was able to see numbers around 10.3 liters for 100 kilometers which is I think really respectable for um, an engine of this size a 4 liter V8 but if you're driving like this of course the number is going to be much higher right now it says we're getting about um, 16 or 17 but I would say a realistic number when you're driving quickly is about 15 liters for 100 kilometers we had the engine running when we were filming so it's just showing a little bit of a higher number at the moment the display is also really cool with the SQ8 you also have this um, digital tachometer so it's kind of like a digital readout you have the speed uh, speedometer below that and the gear position indicator so this is a special view that they have included in the SQ8 uniquely for this version and you don't get that in the standard Q8 so there's a little bit of this um, you know details that make it feel nice but again the red line is at 5000 rpm so <laughs> again a dead giveaway that what you're driving is a diesel engine I'm not against diesels but somehow in this in this combination with this 8-speed Tiptronic in this SUV this complicated diesel engine while it has a lot on paper somehow on the real world in the on the road it still leaves me a little bit wanting we saw that out on the twisty mountain roads um, the QAS Q8 is a bit of a mixed bag and definitely has a great chassis definitely has uh, with that four-wheel steering is very agile but the performance was a little bit underwhelming but of course it's also very important to consider how this large SUV behaves out in the city where there's smaller tighter spaces that this has to navigate through and here again the the rear wheel steering really helps out so I do recommend that I think if you're going to be spending this much money anyway that's an option you shouldn't miss out on this car has so many uh, assistance systems and a lot of technology it's really fantastic they have uh, this connected car kind of a system where right now my car will be monitoring the spaces around me it can even check things like if there's parking spaces available as I drive along other things like of course traffic and weather conditions or road conditions and then it will upload this and uh, to a central server and the other Audi cars will be able to download that information and then that car will say okay hey you want to go to the city center there's a few parking sp spaces available that we have found you can use that or this place has just had a um, you know a, a traffic jam that's avoided and it will navigate around that and this kind of a connected car technology I think is really fantastic so that way <clears throat> this car uses all those sensors like I mentioned so all those cameras and radar sensors around to be able to accomplish this here in this beautiful little French village again I have feel no trouble with navigating this car around I'm in the auto mode in the driving mode there's plenty of driving modes but this auto mode also means that it will kind of decide on its own you know if you want something a little bit more softer with a more delicate throttle response because it because you're in the city and with a lighter steering wheel so it manages all of these things for you and it's just so much easier than to fiddle around with that uh, controller all the time because as much as I really like this infotainment system the drive select system is a little bit difficult to use there's only two small buttons down here and then you have to press it many times I would have rather liked that kind of a rocker switch to go up and down with that being said the suspension is very supple 
thanks to that air suspension, it's very plush and compliant, the ride. And at the same time, thanks to the split anti-roll bars, if I hit a pothole, let's say on the right side, just the right front wheel will be affected. And because that anti-roll bar is not really connected to the other wheels, the other uh, wheels don't get uh, affected by that. So it's a very composed, comfortable ride. I think at the end of the day, that's what this SUV is really great at. It's just being a comfortable, cruising, long distance um, uh, SUV. The steering, while it's really large and I really appreciate the grip and it's it's fun to use out on, on the on twisty roads, even here in the city, because of that progressive rack, it's very easy to turn. I don't have to, I'm not working at the wheel that much and that rear axle steering again just makes it so nimble to dart in and out of traffic. The visibility, however, here as well, it's a little bit of a mixed bag for me because while you have a very upright seating position, this sloping athletic coupe roof line means that the front windshield is not that tall. In fact, in my line of sight, uh, the, the roof already starts quite early. So, and with that dashboard, the actual field of view out front is a little bit limited. Similarly, for the left and right side, um, because of the, um, the large, rear window or the rear view mirror right here in this field of view it kind of blocks uh, you know with the a pillar and that mirror i can't really see what's happening down here and you do feel the size of this suv you feel the width when you're navigating in tight spaces and if there's a curb you know or if you're going around a small roundabout you don't want to you don't want to hit the curb it's really difficult to gauge and see anything on this in this view so that way it's not the best but view out the back is really easy. And again, this has so many different uh, systems. It has that really great 3D augmented um, view where you can really just kind of see everything around you and place the car exactly where it needs to be. The seats are also very comfortable. You have a lot of adjustment. Again, if you push the button in the middle here, then you bring up the seat menu itself and you can have massaging, you can increase or decrease the amount of bolstering on the base, on the side, the extension of the base, of course lumbar support, the reclining, and you can even decide to what extent you want the cooling, the seat ventilation in the backrest or on the base, and how much heating you want on the backrest and on the base. So <laughs> there are so many options and so much of technology. Speaking of technology, another thing that I really like about the SQ8 and the Q8, um, and also some of its platform siblings like the Touareg, which I've driven, is their smart adaptive cruise control system. So I can just set it to the speed, and it will, first of all, behave like any cruise control, it will maintain that speed for me, but, this, but the car is looking at all the traffic around me, it is looking at the navigation, it is looking at the traffic signs. Right now it's telling me, okay, there's some cars around me, plus I'm approaching a, a roundabout. So even though the speed is 70, it is slowing me down in anticipation of this roundabout. The steering assist uh, intervention also means that it will turn for me when I'm making these, um, on the highway especially. And it can even come to a complete stop and start off again. So this system is really cool, it's very useful. I find myself relying on it quite a lot when I'm on the highway, and we'll test that out in a few minutes. But at the same time, you have to be still aware that this is not a, an autonomous vehicle, not yet, it's getting there. So you're still in charge of maintaining a safe, um, uh, remaining focused on the road. When you're driving smoothly with a gentle foot, um, in the, on the highway or on you know just normal country roads you can expect pretty decent mileage for again a four liter v8 diesel a big one like this you can get around um about 10 10.5 and if you put your foot down and you get a little bit you get a little bit uh, rowdy then it's going to be really high so again let's go back to this now it's i've set it to 90 for the speed 
limit. I can also decide how much distance I want it to maintain on average with the vehicles in front. So I'm gonna set it to a safe distance. The heads up display, by the way, is really great. I mean, there's so many different ways you can have the views. The heads up display gives you navigation, your speed, your assistance system information. You have all of that again here in your virtual cockpit. I have a map, I have my navigation instructions, I have the, the speed and so on and so forth. Plus, with this uh, touch screen over here, this haptic feedback, I think this is one of the best systems that I've seen in the recent past. You know, a lot of other manufacturers are really lagging behind in terms of how intuitive this, the main thing is everybody might be able to pack information and technology, but it's not always the most intuitive because let's be honest, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna be able to remember all the different features and how to use them and how to get to these menus. It should just come intuitively and naturally. And I think this, the system really achieves that in a way that a lot of others are not able to do. That anti-tilt function also is, makes, you know, going around roundabouts like this really comfortable because you're not constantly rocking back and forth. So let's set the speed limit again. It says it notices that I'm on the highway. It's 110 kilometers per hour. It has set the speed. It is maintaining the distance. You can see that it's also steering for me as we come around. We'll also notice if there's a larger, more complex bend coming up and it can even slow down to ensure that you have a very composed, um, you know, uh, you know, you're not going too fast when you enter the corner. We can also go into the driving mode here and go into the efficiency mode. Now this engine has a lot of uh, technology to make it more efficient. It can coast, it can deactivate certain cylinders if required and just take over barely and the gearbox will also shift to uh, the top gear which is an eight and then you get a lot of, uh, you, get, you get much better mileage. Right now on the highway we've just started off so it's still a bit higher but we can uh, check in a minute and uh, we'll see how it goes. But on the whole, it's very calm and composed. That sound actuator is also deactivated now in the efficiency mode, so the engine is very hushed. The overall cabin is also very hushed as well because the, um, the sound insulation is really good. They've put a lot of sound deadening throughout the cabin. Even the windshields have uh, extra acoustic damping and that, in that way, you barely hear any wind noise. You do hear a little bit of tire noise, but um, it's not unbearable. Right now the car is recognized that I'm coming to a uh, around a bend and the speed limit is 90, so it's already slowing me down preemptively. So <laughs> the system I think is such a great, um, uh, great way forward and I'm really excited to see this kind of a smart intelligent system trickle down into some of the more entry-level vehicles and uh, that way I think everybody should have this technology. So yeah, while on the highway the SQ8 is you know really at home and really happy, mileage is also getting much better, you can easily expect numbers around 11. I think this is where this SUV is really meant to be and on the German Autobahn when there are no speed limits that's where that 900 Newton meters 435 horsepower that torquey powerful engine, even though it might not shove you back in your seat, will give you that constant high speed performance to crush continents with confidence. But on the twisty mountain roads, that's where it doesn't feel that happy. Let's summarize today's episode. First of all, I hope you guys enjoyed the film. Jonas and I really love filming in this incredible landscape here in the Pyrenees Mountains. So, the Audi SQ8. What is my verdict? Well, with prices starting at 103,000 euros, it does seem a little bit expensive. 
But if you put it into perspective with some of its rivals, including its siblings like the Porsche Cayenne, then it's not so bad. Of course, if you start adding the carbon ceramic brakes, some of the other uh, advances in the uh, technology like the adaptive LED matrix lights, then that price goes up significantly. But still, I think it's not that bad. Of course, it's more expensive than the Tuareg. So, things I didn't like about the SUV, I think would be the drivetrain. Yes, 900 Newton meters sounds like a lot on paper, but somehow on the road, it wasn't giving me that accelerating performance that I was hoping for. The gearbox as well, the eight speed shifts really smoothly, but doesn't have that sharpness that I would like to have from a sporty SUV. Similarly, the steering is also a little bit numb. Yes, you have a little bit more weight in the dynamic mode, but I couldn't get that much feedback and the paddle shifters were not really engaging either. But on the plus side, you have a lot of great hardware in the chassis and suspension, like the adaptive air dampers, the anti-tilt functions for the split roll anti-roll bars, the rear axle steering, and the Quattro with the limited slip differential. Overall, if that engine was a little bit better, I think it would have been a cracker of a uh, sports SUV. Rumor has it that there will be a petrol version sometime next year, and then maybe I can revisit this and see if I feel differently. But the things I do like, actually, there's plenty. I think this car is packed with some of the best technology that we can see trickling down into some of the other smaller and cheaper affordable Audi cars. Some things like the connected system, that haptic feedback touchscreen is also really fantastic. Very intuitive, I think currently one of the best on the market. It's also very comfortable, very relaxing to drive and a very smart car overall. So in the end, if you like the way it looks, and it does look pretty stunning, and you're not really somebody who's gonna be very critical about having very sporty dynamics from a 2.2 ton SUV, then sure, why not? But if you still want this technology and you don't really care about performance, then this is not gonna really meet your needs anyway. Stick to the regular Q8. That's my verdict. Let me know what you guys think. Put it down in the comments below. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe and join us on Facebook and Instagram as well. We take a lot of pictures behind the scenes so you can see what we're up to. Plus we post stories and polls and questions and you can interact with us. Tell us what you wanna know about the episode and we can cater to your needs when we film. Thanks for watching. It's Jonas and me signing off and we'll see you guys next time.